Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be back. I hope everybody's doing good on day two. Uh, I'm still beside my washing machine in Dublin. For those of you who have vision impairment, let me explain. I have a very pale background. I'm wearing an electric green top. I have blonde hair and I cut my fringe very badly yesterday. Um, so inclusive employment. Now, inclusive employment cannot happen without inclusive business cultures. And how do we create inclusive business cultures? We need inclusive leaders. Leaders make choices and those choices create culture. The Valuable 500 was established to break the global business leadership silence because we have two startling facts that were done for us by EY. 54% of our global boards have never had a conversation about disability. And without that conversation, we can't see inclusive cultures, nor can we even hope for inclusive employment. There's another fact. 7% of our C-suite have a lived experience of disability, but four out of five of them are not disclosing. And what does that say for the cultures? We need our leaders to speak up and with and for the disability community. And today in our CEO hour, CEO hour I am absolutely delighted to speak to two C-suite leaders. The other fact that we all know only too well is 80% of the 1.3 billion people with a lived experience of disability is acquired between the ages of 18 and 64. Today, we are delighted to have two leaders who both in the last few years have acquired their disability. And both of them have been very kind to give us their story, their experience. We will be first going to the video with Steve Ingham, who is the group CEO of the Page Group. And then I'm going to be having a live conversation with the wonderful Rob James, who is with us from Switzerland. So, Smita, if you can put on the video of Steve Ingham, and I think we can run with that. Um, Steve Ingham, it is an absolute pleasure uh, to meet you, because I've heard so much about you from our team, the Valuable 500 team, and they're like, you've got to talk to Steve Ingham, you've got to talk to Steve Ingham. So it's just really wonderful to speak to you. And because I guess the most important thing for people to know is that you are one of the very few of the FTSE 250 CEOs um, who has lived experience of disability. And I'm not going to tell your story. Do you want to tell a little bit about your experience with disability? Sure. Um, yeah, I've been the CEO of Page Group, often known by uh, many as Michael Page, for 14 years. Well, two years ago. Uh, I was doing something that probably a lot of CEOs do, and that's go skiing. Um, and uh, for the first time ever, I was skiing on my own, and uh, I managed to lose control on an innocuous slope and disappear down a ravine, and, and uh, nobody saw it happen. So, of course, I was down there, lying in a river, on my back. I instantly knew I was paralysed because the only bit of me that wasn't cold was my legs and uh, so I was sort of lying in the river you know dealing with it I suppose realizing that I was probably gonna be in a wheelchair and I'd have a different sort of challenge ahead of me um, so yeah from then on it was basically for those in the uh, medical world it was a t10 t11 complete fracture so complete fracture means I went right the way through the spinal cord and uh, so I can't feel anything from just below my belly button put put uh, Put bluntly so that people can imagine uh, so I've had to learn how to sort of live life uh, disabled um, you know from the complexity of getting dressed in the morning to all the other things that clearly you you, you need to get control of below your, your waistline so um, which is which is pretty tough so four and a half months in in hospital trying to run a company at the same time as trying did you to did you stay running the company when you were doing rehab or you know, did you not take time off or? Well, I, I was in a coma for three days. I, didn't, yeah. I took those three days off. No, no, well, I took... I'm, I'm kind of glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. You're starting... I took a bit longer. We did. We made an announcement to the stock exchange. You have to do that. And, and to be honest, at that point in time, I'm not sure they knew whether I was going to live or not because they thought I might have a brain injury and I was right. in intensive care and so on. So, so they had to say something. Um, I picked up the reins when I got back from Switzerland, which was uh, a couple of weeks later. 
Um, and I got into a small private hospital, so I had my own room. So I was able to, to talk to my staff, talk to, talk to shareholders, talk to the board. Um, but my priority was first of all, my family, because it was hugely shocking, particularly my daughters who, who traveled out to Switzerland and obviously were faced with their dad lying, you know, with thousands of wires and things plugged into him. Um, and what age are your daughters? Uh, well, one of them's actually her birthday on Monday. She's 29 and I've got 25 and 22. So, I mean, they're, they're not kids, but... Uh, no, no, hold on. They're still your kids. They're well, they're still my kids. And I, yeah. I think as well, you know, they, they've largely got through life without too many big difficulties. Uh, I think probably seeing their dad in that state was, was definitely a big learning experience and a big shock to them. So that was probably the most difficult thing I had to deal with, I think. Um, you know, I don't like upsetting my children. Um, and I'm sure I did. And, uh, you know, so I guess I wanted to use the disability to make them proud of me if they weren't already, hopefully. Um, and I wanted to show how I was going to deal with it and set an example to them. So and, and not just them, um, to, to like my staff, my company, but uh, my other priority had to be to get out of there quickly. So, you know, being in hospitals, OK. <laughs> but, it, you know, I'm thankful I'm not in hospital during COVID because that would have been awful you know, not having visitors and, and so on to support you. But um, I also wanted to do my four or five hours in the gym every day to get fit and, and to learn how to, to deal with things, you know. Were you to... fit before? Like, are you somebody that's in, in, into fitness? Uh, yes, I was a lot. And I, yeah, a bit of a fitness freak, but um, I ran to work most days. So clearly I can't do that anymore. But um and, you know, I suppose I look at it, I try to look at things positively, everything positively. I, you know, when I had the accident, I was 57. Uh, it was actually a couple of days after my birthday. And, uh, you know, I reflected on it. I've done a lot in my life. You know, I'm 57. So most of my career has happened, I guess. Um, oh, you know, no, I, not really. Hold on. Go, hold on. There's you're talking as if you're 90 years old here. Will you cut it out? There's years, there's years in the tank, uh, I guess. But um, yeah, look, I, I've, I've done a lot. I've run a lot. I, I ran in nearly every city that I went to. I ran with colleagues a lot. I did a lot of sponsored stuff. You know, the Great Wall of China, these sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, I played golf badly. And, you know, I played rugby till I was 40. So, yeah, I've done a lot. And I feel that my legs, you know, I, I enjoyed them while I had them. So I didn't waste that opportunity, if you like. Um, but now they're having a rest. And, uh, you know, clearly I have to lift them everywhere that I go, which is, uh, I've realised now how heavy they are. And, and of course, you know, I, I love being six foot four before. I was about to say, what, are you tall? Are you a tall man? My yeah. father was six foot six and he was a rugby player. So, uh, but he was also very big. Are, are you tall? properly tall and sadly gets you into the second row, guaranteed. Six, <laughs> six. six foot four, you can just about blag it to, to get into the you know the back row rather than the second row um so yeah i was tall but not as tall as him um and that's actually works against you when you're disabled ironically because it just means that the levers are too long and and you know you're, you're sort of pulling very long legs up onto the bed next year or into the wheelchair or, or whatever so um it does make life a bit more awkward as i found out yeah, I can imagine. I, I, I tended to focus more on my legs, whereas now, of course, I have to focus on... Here, the upper body, yeah. Which I sort of overdid last year because I managed to break all the titanium in my back. So uh, right, okay. I had to go through the whole process of an operation again and have it all replaced. Right, you're stubborn, I'm guessing, yeah? Sorry? Are you a stubborn person? Pretty stubborn, I suppose. I mean, you know, I was, I was told not to exercise when I broke them the first time, second time. Um... So I had to take three months out of the gym. It's probably better for everyone around me that I just exercise. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like I, I, it's it's part of keeping keeping me real and grounded is exercise. Actually, one of the things that I find very hard about being somebody who is registered blind and with low vision, it's I miss the the companionship actually of playing sports with other people, and that's why running for me is so important. And now I run with a sighted guide. Uh, I, I used to run on my own, which was quite ridiculous, but <laughs> now I'm on the side of guide. But, it, but like me without exercises, I don't think I'm a pretty, I don't, I wouldn't want to be around me. No, it's better to do it. And then it, you can justify everything else you do in the day, can't you? If you've been yeah. well done or you've done a bit of exercise. 
Can I ask you, um, what was your experience of disability before your accident? I mean, did, did it even cross your radar? Did it, did it come into your life? Um, yeah, like, was it something you were aware of even? Good question. I mean, no, to a degree, yes, because we'd already launched, um, we're, we're, I think, ahead of the game, ahead of most companies on diversity as a, as a general rule. Um, we don't and why want, is that? Is that you or is that your people listen, and you listening to your people or where does that come I'd from? I'd like to think both. I mean, okay. you know, I, I know what it's like to be uncomfortable in an environment trying, you know, to, to not in being able to be your full or complete self. I know what that's like because I went to boarding school. I had a lot, you know, a few issues when I first went to boarding school and was bullied a lot. You know, I was the, well, I wasn't the tallest kid. I was, I was sort of medium height. But you were gangly, were you? No, I was the fattest kid. I know that's really? sounds... Oh, that's where you're... Oh, <laughs> it's so interesting because that's where your gym stuff came from, right? So you're kind of feeling oh, you're always the fact you know, that... You should, you should be a psychologist. The, the, uh, yes, you're right, probably. Um, and also, if you're the fattest kid and you've never played rugby before, you get made to be the rock. And that wasn't much fun either. And I was 11 and suddenly you're away from home for 12 weeks and you know, everyone's picking on you. And, and you know, I realised that uh, it's not great, but... Certainly, I would hate to be in the work environment. I mean, it makes no difference. If you're going to work and there's something different about you that you don't want to admit to and you can't even be yourself, I can't see how you can perform and enjoy yourself. And um, so we focused on diversity when I became CEO. We, we, uh, we, st we started uh, really with women at page and then we w moved up through basically. Um, ability at page, had, your, your question earlier, had already kicked off. I suppose a lot of the, we, we had a lot of people coming out and talking about their experience and most of it was around mental health. Yeah. Um, which it was incredibly powerful. And I have had some experience of that with friends and so on. Um, the only experience I'd had of a spinal injury was actually one of my best friends, if not my closest friend, his daughter about eight years ago. She had a skiing accident uh, in America, and uh, she's a sea level injury, so up in wow. the lower neck. Yeah, uh, she's tetraplegic, and and you know I, I'd never, I'd never asked a lot of questions of him. You know, I, he's quite a private person on that sort of front. But um, you know, the the updates I would get from him on on what she'd achieved. You know, she'd gone back to university, done a PhD in psychology to support people like us, or like me anyway. And um, you know, she's met an able-bodied person, got married, had a baby. You know, and I, I just, I just that warms my heart. It really does, and and I think that's fantastic. So, but that that was the limit of my experience, and they're based in Australia, so it's not like I, I would see her. Yeah. Or, um, so I was always, you know, getting stories rather than actually seeing her and, and living it firsthand. Um, so no, uh, beyond that, limited. And I think that's probably the case for most of us. Isn't and, it? and look in your industry as well, because it's really interesting. Um, just what your what the page group does. Um, but like, had that even surfaced? Had disability even surfaced oh. within that? Like, or you know, I know. Look, we're, we're all now starting finally to talk really, and I think really engage with what inclusion, diversity, belonging is and what, you know, that the business is representing the society to which it operates in. But I mean, that, that, I mean, it's been slow coming, hasn't it? And had disability ever been brought up by your clients before? Um, rarely is the honest answer, um, sadly, rarely. Uh, I think diversity has definitely been brought up by our clients. And, and what was diversity for your clients? Because I was interested. In, like, it well, was they all start with gender. I think that, they, yeah. that, that that's, to be fair, yeah. because they feel it's the most obvious. Yeah. Probably the easiest thing to impact, maybe. Um, you know, and, and I suppose the, the obvious difference is that you can generally tell a, a, a boy from a girl. You know, um, so it's fairly straightforward. You yeah. know, I can see which category you're in. Um, with disability, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because we know that 80% of dis disabled people, it's, it's or their disability is invisible. Um, no, I mean, I get away with this. I mean, people wouldn't have a clue that I, I, don't, I don't see you. No, I know. Well, I saw you on Breakfast TV, I think it was, and, and uh, I certainly hadn't picked up on it. You were talking about the Valuable 500, and, and I was thinking, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> and you explained why and, and said, you know, this is, this is why, well, why, why you were interested in it. 
and why it was a topic even though you were pursuing it and and uh, okay can I actually can I just sorry to interrupt you but I'm really interested in just that is it because this is a piece is if we don't have a personal experience of it is that why it's been missing out of business conversations I think that is so interesting that you said like well why would she be talking about it if she doesn't have a lived experience you don't have to be. I think you were passionate about it. You were talking passionately about it. I wondered why you were so passionate. Now, that could be that half of your family are disabled. It, it yeah. might not have been you, or it could have been your best friend. It could have been anyone. But something probably would jog you into being passionate about it. Um, that's the same question you asked me earlier. Why, you know, what, what, had I had any exposure? Was I interested in it? Whatever. But um, so I, I suppose that, that, that I, I don't think you have to have a personal experience. I mean, any more than you, you know, our biggest issue was gender and we were addressing that. I'm not a woman, um, you know, but I could still see True. the problem. I was losing yeah. great women. Yeah. Um, the, the disability thing, I mean, particularly around mental health, it, it didn't, it doesn't take a gene. We've got about 7,000 staff, uh, 52 of them, 52% of them are women, you know, the rest are men. Very, very often, most of them are very young. Uh, well, young to me anyway, um, you know, in their sort of mid, late 20s, it wouldn't be a surprise to me that a lot of them had mental health issues or some sort of disability, but I just wouldn't be aware of it. And, and so it's an important thing that we support them. Um, so we'd, we'd driven that agenda for a couple of years, but I didn't understand disability in the same way they understand it now. And I'm only just starting to learn even now. I mean, I have a day job, I'm a family man, and also, I'm trying to learn about disability. I know quite a bit about spinal injuries for obvious reasons. I've been in hospital for four and a half months, and you know, you 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 know, things rub off on you. You learn a lot from the medical professionals, and also, of course, other patients, which I got to know. Um, but I'm starting to learn about other areas of, of disability. Frankly, some of those impress me even more than some of the battles that people with spinal injuries go through, and. Uh, and that's what impresses me about the people as individuals. They, they, they offer so much, and yet they seem to be constrained on what they can give to society. And that's Yeah, wrong. there's barriers in the way to enabling that potential to be released. I think that it's not just in business, but I think with us, with the Valuable 500, and this is why it's such an important community now, was that we felt the scale of the crisis with all those barriers, we, we just, it can't be resolved by governments and charities and conventions. It, need, it needs you. It needs business. It, it needs business. This is the most powerful force to remove those barriers, to see the value of this community and their family, by the way. Well, um, the, yeah. yeah. And the stupidity of all of this is that you asked me earlier what uh, clients are asking about. Did they ever ask about disability or whatever? Um, no, but one, one, one thing they always say is that they are all agreed upon is that there is a war for talent out there. Yeah. I mean, it is desperately difficult to, to find extremely good candidates for all the roles that they want to recruit for. Mm -hmm. And yet there is this pool of 20% of the population that are absolutely qualified and frankly have the personal skills to probably add more value to their business than maybe some of the able-bodied candidates were able to find for them. So it is made even more ridiculous because I think they probably look at it in the wrong way. They look at the issues and the difficulties and the challenges and the problems we'll create for them and the fact that, I don't know, we'll need more time off or we're, we're you know, we're not as able i mean i must admit i don't like the term disabled and abled because I, oh, I, I just don't I, I think there's too much conversation about that anyway you know we have a disability we have an impairment but like yeah it's part of who i am it's not who i am well yeah, that's right but it's almost in the word isn't it because you know abled or not abled and 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 yet i think i've got as much ability as a ceo yeah. as anyone else yeah uh, i know what you mean yeah. it's not disability or ability it's it's exactly. all of it Exactly. So there's certain things I might not be able to do, like, like dance very well and so on in a wheelchair. In fact, I, I managed to do a backwards flip in my wheelchair dancing. Okay, would you be oh. careful? Seriously, because a friend of mine who is a wheelchair user did exactly that and re-broke his back. So would you just be careful, right? Maybe that's how I broke the rods in my back. I don't yeah, know. you know what? Like, just come on. <laughs> like... Well, I, I won't. Yeah, after a couple of drinks, I probably didn't feel it, so that probably helped. Um, so, you know, the, the, here's, the, here's the irony, isn't it? You know, most leaders understand that there's a war for talent and they can't attract the candidates they need. And yet 
a lot of them are subconsciously ignoring this great pool of talent. So that's one element to it. The other is, and, and this is something that I think I've learned in the 34 years I've been in recruitment, I, I've interviewed a lot of people, of course, in that time. Um, there hasn't been enough coming through the pipeline as well. And, and that is because some of the challenges, I think it's 80% of, of people who are disabled, they actually get their disability through their lifetime. And yeah, words, between ages 80 and 64, when you're in work, mostly. There you go. Um, and so, you know, they're often dealing with that disability. I mean, they, mm. they feel very different to how they mm. felt before. You know, clearly I do. I'm a lot shorter, for example. Uh, you know, clearly there are certain things I can't do as quickly. You know, I, so for that reason, I have to be better organized than I ever was before. I thought I was super organized before as mm. well. But now I have to be even more so because certain things take longer, like getting dressed in the morning. Yeah. So, you know, um, that can knock people's confidence big time, obviously. And, and so, you know, I've met a lot of kids who've had accidents like the one I've had. And typically it is a lot of kids because you can imagine if you're going to break your back, it's usually doing something daft. It's the sort of thing that we all did when we were in our teens or in our mm -hmm. early 20s, diving into a swimming pool that's not yeah. deep enough or, you know, falling off a off bike. Yeah, coming off your bike or riding a horse or whatever you're yep. doing, something crazy. Rugby. Rugby. Climbing into a party, I heard, you know, when rather than going through the front door and paying or whatever, <laughs> oh. um, the wall collapsed, you know, and, uh, you know, and he gets a sea level injury. Great. For the rest of his life. Um, you know, and he, he was being naughty, but that's about it. But how is that going to knock your confidence when you're 18 years old? Um, now, I've dealt with it because I'm quite a confident person. I've achieved a reasonable amount, I'd like to think. Um, but if I was 18, about to head to university or something, and all my mates were disappearing there, how would I have reacted? And probably in a different way. And, and for that reason, some of those people are not getting into the pipeline. So we've got to really look at uh, the long game here and how we can make them feel as wanted, as needed as anybody else. So that they can they can feel pulled out of their off the sofa, you know, where they're they're sort of sitting and and, and feeling that they've got no value to anyone, and 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 hopefully attract them into the pipeline of going to university and so on. So you know that that that's. But do you think that this generation? I mean, so I grew up obviously hiding my disability, and um, I look at the generation now, you know, the under thirties, and I have got you have you cannot but have great optimism because it feels like we're talking about disability pride, that generation with the tools that we didn't have growing up, social media, they're informed, they're, they're convening, and they're this incredibly powerful, loud voice around what their, what their value is and what, and what we have to offer. And I'm thinking as a CEO, well, I want that younger generation as my totally. consumers and as my talent and, you know, but most importantly, it's like people, young people who don't even have a disability will not accept companies who are keeping people out. They just, they just won't. So it's such a compelling, this particular age group, I think, in this time is the greatest chance we have. To, oh, to without, without doubt. And, and I look, there's no doubt about it. The younger generation looks at life generally differently than we did when we were young. But um in many, many ways. I mean, they're, 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 they're more critical, they're, more, they're yeah. more judgmental. I mean, you know, people are talking already about COVID and the impact on the recruitment market. Well, I can tell you now that lockdown is a great time to reflect, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, we've all got time to reflect. Are we happy living where we live, in the type of accommodation we've got, yeah. the person that we're with, are we happy with that? You know, do we want to live on our own or with people? Are we happy in the sector or the job, et cetera? And already candidates are doing things, doing something about it if the answer is no. Um, you know, we, we joke about people getting, you know, sadly getting divorced, you know, because of COVID and they're saying, oh, you know, okay, enough's enough. Um, because they've been through a period of reflection and they're going, right, I'm going to do something about it. Um, so, you, you know, th there is no doubt about it. In the younger generation, it is more positive than probably we are, were, and also they get more support on the whole. Um, that said, you know, there's some horrific statistics around spinal injuries, which will tell you that the average, I think, that you somebody would be in hospital with an injury like this was five, five and a half months. Today, it's three. Mm. 
something's missing in that last yeah. two months. What was it? And a lot of it's around psychological support, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It is still difficult. And then you're getting advice from the older generation as well. So exactly. 35% of people will get the advice. Do not mention your disability on your application. Okay, so this is, so I hid mine, right? And uh, so 21 years ago, I came out of the closet. So you probably are aware, because you've heard it when EY did the research for us, 7% of our C-suite, of which you are part of, have lived experience of disability. But four out of five of them are hiding it. Or not, that sounds negative. Four out of five of them aren't owning it publicly. And so to your point, the older generation are telling people to not declare it. We're not declaring it still. And I guess why is, is the issue. And, and we, we can say fear and all of that stuff. But in, in you, you're a kind of a, a lived example. So did your shareholders after your accident did you feel that they were kind of like, oh, well, what are we going to do with Steve now? Like, was there any of that kind of, did they, did people's perceptions of you change? Like, did you see that fear come out or the uncomfortableness that could be the barrier for this? Not really. I mean, it, it, it crossed my mind, of course. Um, and I had a conversation with somebody that I've got a lot of respect for who um, you know, I've known for a long time in my career, and it wouldn't be fair to mention him, but uh, he called me up when I was in the hospital and we hadn't spoken for a while. And uh, he said, oh my God, you know, I'm really sorry to hear this. And I said, oh, don't, you know, don't be sorry, I'm fine. Um, and he got, came along to the conversation and said, well, what are you gonna do when you get out? You know, get out of hospital. Uh, and I said, well, I'm gonna go back and run, run page. You know, I've, I've still got a few things to, to do that I want to achieve and, and some goals to hit, a vision to achieve and so on. Um, and he said, but you're still, you're in a wheelchair. And I said, I noticed. And he said, well, you can't. And I said, why not? And he said, well, they won't take you seriously. They won't see you anymore. And I, 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 I didn't want to get in an argument with him or, or didn't you know, want to get angry. So, you know, I just said, well, look, I see it differently now. I, I'd already gone through an experience which made me realize quite the opposite. And that was, I was getting, because I've been 34 years in the same company, it was only a couple of hundred people when I joined, it's now 7,000. I've traveled every country, launched many of them. And, and so, you know, a lot of people know me. I always publicly speak whenever I go to an office, to everybody from the receptionist to the managing director or whatever. I'll do an open Q&A. They can fire anything at me and, and, and do so, you know, I was quite well known. I went running with a lot, a lot, a lot of them and, and so on. So, of course, they were, they'd heard about the accident. We'd made the announcement. Um, and uh, they were sending me emails saying, well, look, when you're better, come back and run in Centennial Park with us or run in, you know, Central Park with us or run, you know, whatever. And I thought they don't clearly grasp the injury, do they? Um, but we hadn't explained that. We just said I'd had a bad accident. Um, so they had no idea. So when I was pain-free enough, which uh, was a few weeks. Uh, I got one of the carers to get me into a white shirt like this, and, and uh, I held my iPad up on, on the tray that sort of you wheel in front of you on, over your bed, and I managed to get propped up enough in bed like this and, and recorded basically what had happened to me. And, 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 you know, I recorded the stupidity of the skiing accident and, um, you know, going into the stream and, and uh, you know, being rescued and, and, and so on. And, you know, what had upset me, you know, the, the kids, going back to my kids, being shocked by it. And, um, you know, and I talked about the fact that I won't be going running with anyone and that I am actually going to be in a wheelchair. Yes, I, I will be the quickest in a wheelchair and, and I'll have a flash one uh, if I can afford it. But, um, and all that sort of thing. But, and, and, I, and I said, look, you know, I'm getting a lot of, uh, notes saying really sorry to well don't be sorry for me you know and I, I said don't be sorry for me I'm fine you know I'm gonna recover I'm gonna be strong and you know I'll be back at work and, and everything and, and of course I then got uh, I did this video put it on our internal social media on Yammer and um, wow I honestly didn't expect the reaction I got I mean I got 7,000 emails whatsapp messages parcels food parcels from all over the world I mean it was great um, and you know, incredible comments, really powerful stuff that, you know, I was inspiring them. They'd shown it to their children. Goodness knows what. And, and I realized this was far from lowering my 
respect in the business, it, it was actually raising it because in their eyes, you know, I was overcoming an enormous challenge, which I suppose, you know, I suppose that was the case. And um, if anything, I think their respect went up, not down. The fact that I did come back from that and didn't give up. Um, and, you know, particularly during COVID, people are still emailing me and saying, you know, whenever I feel down, whenever I, I think of you and some of the things you're having to overcome or had to overcome, you know, and, uh, and that, was, that, that was inspiring. And I realized my responsibility as well. I mean, there was no way I was, could hide this anyway for obvious reasons. I've got a wheelchair under me. But, you know, the, there's something positive in this, that I've got to be a role model, not just to my children, which of course I have, but I've got to be a role model to, to as many people as possible. That, that's how I see it. Has your I leadership mean, changed because of your accent? Well, I, I can't travel as much. I mean, that there is there are certain things that do you are restrained by. I mean, I, I went to, I think, 26 different countries in 2018. I, I, I managed three in uh, 2019. And, and uh, obviously this year, even fewer for mm. obvious reasons. But um, so, you know, the management styles change slightly. But I think what's made, I think genuinely, I'm, I, I now have a better understanding of some of the challenges people are facing. And before, I probably couldn't empathize as well as I can now. I mean, uh, you know, what would I say to those people hiding uh, the fact that they're disabled and they feel they need to? Uh, I, I would say don't, because the most in, one of the most important qualities about leadership, I believe, is authenticity. And how can you be authentic if you're pretending to be something you're not, which is what you're doing if you're hiding a disability, surely? So I am what I am, you know, big, ugly, bald guy that happens now to be in a I'm about to say your biggest problem is you've got no hair. I'm married to a man who's no hair. <laughs> so, but it's like... not a problem. I mean, everyone's moaning about the fact they can't go to the hairdressers or <laughs> roots sorted or whatever. I, I, hello, no problem. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to, to me, I'm what I am. I mean, you know, I'm still the same pain that I probably was to a lot of people before. And I'm as demanding as a leader um, I hope I'm a little bit more inspiring. Um, I hope people think of, you know, business is about going through challenges, isn't it? And we're, you know, most businesses are going through challenges at the moment related to COVID and so on. Um, I know a bit about challenges, a bit more than I did before two years ago. You so, uh, just different you know, challenges. Just um, looking at the positives. So as we're coming to a close, I, you know, as of today, we have 421 companies uh, as part of our valuable 500 family, you know, and we started out to break, you know, the global leadership silence, the business leadership silence on disability inclusion. And you're one of them that has, we've done it. Like we've, we're, we're reaching 18 million employees globally through to our community. And so now we're moving to, the, to phase two where we're going to activate you leaders and your businesses to really, you know, to hack a solution for disability business inclusion across our supply chains. Um, so I just, I want, I, I'd love just to hear from you about what you think, your gut instinct about what stands in the way of us actually changing this system, because I believe we can, we've got 500 of you you know, we've got your, the power of your supply chains, the power of you leaders, the power of your employees, the power of your brands. What do you think stands in the way for other leaders to, to be part of this? What do you think is their barrier? And what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's fear. Uh, I think that uh, there's, there's a problem with prioritization. So in other words, you know, some leaders will be just prioritizing other things. We've got other things that are more important right now than, than, than that one. Uh, it could be that they're starting to work in, through diversity and they're just they're going, right, well, you know, we're going to do gender first. And then, um, you know, maybe we'll, uh, we'll do sexual orientation next because that's that's quite, you know, that's quite um, fashionable at the moment or whatever. And, you know, and then uh, and then we'll eventually get to disability, maybe. I mean, obviously, race came to the forefront as it should have done last year and it should have been there all along. But um you know, and, and sort of disability is the bit on the end where people go, well, yeah, we must take care of them. Uh, we must look after them. Absolutely. Yeah. They need our help. They need our care. Well, we don't. Actually, the majority of the sector who are disabled don't need us, you know, be cared for or 
we don't need pity or sympathy or anything else actually we just need to be respected like an able-bodied person and, and given an opportunity and uh, you know I think again if I was trying to defend them uh, I would say that I understand the disabled sector is quite complicated mm -hmm. you know it's it's not a simple thing we're not all in wheelchairs or something we're not like all the that. same no that's right we can't sort of just identify with them easily we we're not even aware of some of them and we certainly don't know necessarily how to deal with it if we do need to accommodate any sort of um anything that might just make their life easier or whatever but uh, you know the, what my answer would be well just talk about it i mean if you need to talk to people like me i mean i you know i've got a view on disability and obviously i've got maybe quite a lot of credibility to talk about it because i'm clearly disabled myself and 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 so let, let us sort of try to unlock this theory that it's complicated, expensive, that we are weaker, that we can't do as much for you or, or whatever. We can probably prove otherwise. You know, like, like I said, overcoming challenges is what a business is about. I honestly believe those with a disability overcome probably more challenges in a day than most able-bodied people have to go through in their lifetime. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine some of the challenges you have, um, you know, and I, I certainly see that advert on television where the lady says to Alexa, you know, what, what's the weather out there? And, and the Alexa goes, it's raining and she, she puts the dog on the lead and, and she you know, puts a coat on and goes outside and, and she can't obviously see. And, and I just think, oh, my God, I'm not sure I could do that. I think she's probably the bravest person on the planet. And, and the challenges that we have to overcome with our different disabilities, I think potentially makes us better. Um, and we should be using that, using that in, in the workplace. And, and, and it's, it's, it's crazy that not, we're incredibly resilient. I mean, you know, it's tough to get through some of these disabilities and, and you have to be tough to do it. You know, I, I've, I've had a lot of operations, a huge amount of pain being very close to death, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think, Personally, having interviewed a lot of people over 35 years, people who've been through those sorts of challenges have so much more to offer. I agree. And I think, therefore, on the one hand, you're talking about this shortage of talent, this war for talent. On, on the other, you've got this fantastic pool of people, 20% of the population, you know, 14% of the population are graduate disabled, you know, so they're qualified and yet they're being ignored. And that, you know, a lot of it's been ignored. And that, that's absolutely ludicrous. And, uh, you know, while, while, there's, you know, while there's a breath in my body, I'm going to be shouting about it. Um, you know, I think it's great that we've joined up with, with the Valuable 500. And uh, combined, I think that can be a real force. Wherever I can help, I will. And I'm just trying to learn a bit more so I sound a bit more knowledgeable than it, I probably do at the moment. But uh, there we go. Well, Steve Ingham, thank you. And we will be shouting on you for help. Um, and, and I really mean it. I think it's a roar now. <laughs> There's going to be 500 of you. Um, sure. And thank you. I thank you for stepping up with us and being part of it. And I hope if we were to have a conversation in three years time, we are not talking about the same thing. No, so. there's more progress than there is today anyway. Yeah. That's good. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much. Thanks. Muting. Rob. <laughs> Rob James, it is wonderful to have you. We talked a year ago. Um, and I, I have so many questions. I'm sure you have so many things that resonate from listening to Steve. Can you see why I wanted you two to meet? Um, but before we go anywhere, why don't you just explain who you are? You you can explain better to anybody who you are, your background. Um, and then let's jump into a conversation. Super. Uh, so good morning, Caroline. Good morning, everyone from a very snowy uh, Zurich here in Switzerland. Um, by way of background, um, I've had an amazing journey with a 35 year career in IT. Um, who could have believed when I started in uh, 1984 that IT would have had such a profound impact um, you know, both good and, and maybe in some instances bad as well. 
but uh, it's been quite a journey. You know, I've been blessed to work during that time in four leading companies. Um, I started with Xerox, which back in the 80s was arguably the leading technology company. Um, I spent 13 years then at Procter & Gamble, uh, le leading retail consumer goods company, uh, both in the US, working in the US, uh, as well as in Europe. Um, and then I spent 13 years at Novartis, a leading pharmaceutical company, um, and it very much enjoyed and was grateful for uh, leveraging IT to help bring some incredible new medicines to market that had a very positive impact on millions of lives. And then more recently, the last four years at ADECO, the world's largest staffing company, with the honorable mission of finding work uh, for people, uh, including underserved populations. Um, so it's been quite a, quite a journey. And um, again, I was fortunate to progress to be group CIO at Novartis and uh, and then Group CIO at um, ADECO, leading IT in both of those companies. Um, during that time, you know, for me, for balance, there were two key factors. Um, like many family, uh, I also have two daughters who I actually call my kids, even though they're 28 and 30. Uh, I have a wonderful wife, Vishala. And we're a close family, we do everything together. And, uh, and also during that time, I, I have to confess, um, I loved sports, you know, that, that was my release. Um, I represented my university at rowing, at uh, football, and at rugby, although I'm a lot smaller than Steve. And, uh, and you know, my entire working life, I, I played football into my 40s, um, I was playing competitive squash uh, up until recently uh, for 15 years. And then uh, a couple of years back, sort of got into, you know, triathlons, Olympic distance. Um, was never very good at them, actually, because I'm a fast twitch fiber person, very explosive. And you need to be sort of, you know, you need to have more endurance. And so... Uh, so I trained really hard in 2018 for 12 months. Uh, did, you know, uh, 3,000 kilometers on my bike training, swam, you know, almost 100 miles, uh, many times across Lake Zurich. Um, well, not a very good swimmer. And, um, and ran a bit as well, you know. And so in October of 2018, um, I participated in a, in a company event in uh, Lanzarote. Uh, it was an Olympic distance triathlon. Um, I had the most incredible swim, best swim I've ever done. Uh, first time I've ever beaten my wife uh, in, in a race and I uh, got out of the water, smashed the bike, and then 10 kilometers before the finish of the bike, um, I had an accident, uh, which was serious and uh, Long story short, I I broke my spine, I broke my all of the, my ribs, uh, collapsed, pierced lung, I broke my sternum, uh, lots of internal injuries. So I, I was a mess. Uh, spent five weeks in intensive care. They had to fly me back uh, from Lanzarote to um, the uh, Notefield uh, world class spinal cord injury facility uh, in Switzerland, here in Switzerland. And uh, spent five weeks in intensive care and actually 12 months pretty much for the most part um, in hospital. Um, during that time, I had to go through a major rehab, just like Steve mentioned, uh, which was hard, but also was quite inspiring for me at the time. And uh, finally got back then to do in many sports, again, some new. And some old, you know, like learning to ski again was was quite the quite the experience actually. Um, but throughout all of that, I was again blessed to have this incredible wife uh, and two wonderful girls that were were part of that journey. Um, and during that twelve months, you know, I got to see many young kids who, um, you know, I, I had this kind of epiphany. Uh, 
you know, if I look back at my career uh, uh, from the age of 20, if I was in a wheelchair at 20, do you think I would get a chance to work for Xerox, Procter & Gamble, uh, Adeco, Novartis? Um, I don't necessarily mean these companies, but sort of similar, and travel and all over the world and have jobs that, you know, I had to, you know, be in 20 countries in one year. Um, today, right, probably not likely. And so that became sort of the, the germ of an idea, which, you know, has now subsequently turned into my new motivation, which is I want, I want to try and find, um, help find work for these people and match them with large companies. And so, you know, that, that was where the inspiration for what we met with uh, Caroline and the, the value of 500 and ADECO getting involved. And really now is my new mission. I, I have to say, I, I have no problem admitting I have a massive soft spot for you. Um, I think one of the things is how honest you are. Um, and when we spoke last year, just before Davos, and then the other day, I I really was, I'm really struck by the fact that you admit that you had a very different perception of disability before you have a lived experience. And I think that's a very powerful message for leaders. Do, do you want to share that, what we spoke? No, of, co of course, Caroline. Um, you know, as, as I think back to before my injury, you know, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to say, um, you know, I really didn't know anything about people in a wheelchair, spinal cord injury or, or being disabled. Um, you know, it wasn't that I didn't want to or, you know, if I'm honest, I, I guess I was frightened. You know, walking up to somebody in a wheelchair, I wouldn't know what to say. I had no frame of reference. Um, you know, uh, asking them what happened to you, is that good, is that not good? I wouldn't know. And so I, I sort of would, 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 I guess, shy away from that. Um, you know, not because I didn't want to, it was just not wanting to offend, I, I, I guess, in a, in a way. And now on the other side of the fence, obviously I have a very different perspective. And I think the other thing is that perspective is, is very powerful for now for leaders to start to hear. And I think you have a passion around high potential talent and you now are in a position Rob, you're in a position to do something about this. So how can you help be the bridging gap um, in that new frame of reference that you're going to speak to, to help high potential talent get into positions of influence? Yeah, okay, so, so you, you know, my, uh, my experience was, uh, you know, while being in hospital um, and rehabbing, there were some really interesting other senior managers from different companies I met, you know. One had a biking accident, one a skiing accident. And, you know, we all were the same opinion. We, we saw some of these young kids and they were so inspiring. They were so resilient, uh, so smart. And uh, in the discussions we were having, it was like, wait a minute, you know, um, there's something wrong here. We, we've got to do something to, to help solve this problem. And, and for me, you know, reflecting on, on my experience, you know, I probably think there are some senior people that actually view disabled people as not being able to get the job done. You know, and, and not, not everyone, but I'm sure there are some people like that. I think there are some people that probably um, get it already and, and they know what's possible and they're not frightened of that. And maybe there are, are many like myself before uh, who just you know, didn't want to get involved or maybe were frightened of getting involved and uh, just needed that bit of encouragement. And so so, so in, in thinking back to this, you know, um, I, I think right, uh, many of those populations uh, of managers just need experience, exposure, okay? And uh, and I think, right, that's what we've got to do. We've, we've got to get these smart, resilient people you know, uh, of any disability, uh, we've got to get them at least exposed to senior management mm -hmm. to open up a way where we can, okay, now, now that you see and you're comfortable and you realize the resilience of how smart they are, leave alone uh, the fact that you bring these people in your organization and watch the positive impact on the culture of your organization, because it will happen.
And um, and so that's, you know, uh, working at ADECO, I'm in a unique position where, uh, you know, we can help make that happen, right? And it's about exposure. And I'm just mindful of time, but there's two questions I have to ask you. Sorry, Zero, but I have to ask this. Um, did your accident change the way you lead? Um, you know, you heard me asking the same of, of Steve. And, and has that changed the way you lead, do you think? I, I, you know, to some degree, I, I think fundamentally, you know, I, I would say like Steve, I'm the same person, you know, at heart. Um, you know, I've got some different passions now <laughs> that, you know, I, I want to have a positive impact. And I think I, I, I can do that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I find it, uh, I've got a much higher injury than Steve. Yes. Uh, so there are different problems with that, but tra travel in particular is a challenge. So while I can't do so much of that, you know, there are other skills I think you, you, you develop and uh, I'm a much better listener than I was before, trust me. And <laughs> I think, you know, even my kids tell me that now. And uh, and so, yeah, you know, the experience of going through this has been humbling on many fronts. And so I, I think that helps you develop, you know, different skills that I hope in some way may, maybe makes me a better leader. And, uh, and and the final question, really, what's fantastic is that after you're at ADECO, you stay with ADECO. You know, you've stayed with ADECO. You're choosing to have the career that you want to do, win for youth. That's what you want to do. Did you find the company saw Rob the same way before and after the accident? It, it, was that hard for them? Um, because it sounds like they made huge, um, huge accommodations. They wanted you, the leader, to stay with them, the leader. Yeah, you, you know, it's it's it, it. It was interesting, and and on the one hand, while I hadn't been at a deco for many years, uh, we we have quite a unique culture and. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, from Alan De Hayes, our CEO, and wanted to get more involved with the Win for Youth program and uh, employment, give disability inclusion and employment in that that sense. And so we saw this, you know, combined as a as a joint opportunity. And so I don't think the company could have done any more. They were fantastic, and and you know. Uh, for me, you know, I, I, I think that's the opportunity, you know, for other companies aren't, that aren't that way, hey, you know, you need to get it. It makes a big difference. And I, I think all the employees, you know, I, I was a visible figure and uh, all of the employees would have been watching this. So I wow. think that even contributes more to our, you know, amazing culture. Well, can I say a huge thank you to you, wonderful Rob James, and I'm sure there's plenty of people who'd like to reach out to you, so if that's okay, we'll, we'll keep them in touch, but a massive thank you for your leadership. Thank you uh, for being with us this morning, and a very big hug. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Bye now. So everyone, um, to say... I don't think we could have had a better combination of CEOs and leaders to speak. Actually, to be honest, I wish we'd had way more time. Um, both Steve and Rob um, are open to speaking and discussing and being in touch, so please do reach out. Both the companies, ADECO and Page Group, are in the field of recruitment. And since the theme is around employment, it is so important that we have leaders who have lived experience, who are willing to speak to us, who are willing to be challenged. What we're hearing again and again, and particularly in these two conversations from both of those leaders, is fear. And we have, I think the most important thing that we all can do together, as Rob best referred to, is exposure. And when we know, what we do know is 80% of disability is invisible. And the more people that are willing to come out and tell their story, um, I also similarly hit my disability. So the more of us are willing to tell our story, to create environments where people are confident and capable uh, and competent to come out, I think that is where we will start to see a shift. Um, so I want to say a big thank you to all of our valuable 500 companies. 
to all the leaders that are willing to stand up, to learn, to say that they don't have the answers, to willing to ask the questions. And I think that's really what we need to see, is leaders saying, we don't know, teach us, um, tell us what to do. Um, and I think we, as a community, need to help them learn. So big thank you both to Steve and to Rob. Thank you to Zero Project, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow to give you the valuable 500 story so far. And let us close that gap. Let us close that gap that when we began the valuable 500, 54% of our global boards have never had a conversation about disability. Let us make sure that that no longer exists. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.